now let me introduce my guest. And then <coughs> we start this morning's uh, discussion. It's a packed morning, and we'll try and get to as many of the issues that we have tabled for discussion as possible. So my guests who are right here, seated in the studio. Um, OK, so if you can see, put the camera on the document, as always. There's one bag full of documents. And then you have various files. How many of them? One, two, three, four, five. Also full of documents. And then there'll be another bag right there, always. That's what it is. So that's Abdul Malik Kwekubako. Um, his bags are here. I suspect by now he's getting ready to join us. Okay, here he comes. So my guest will be Abdul Malik Kwekubako, Editor-in-Chief of the New Crusading Guide newspaper. Also here in the studio is Dr. Eric Odro Osaim. He's a lawyer and a governance expert. In fact, I make a little reference uh, to his book, Fiscal Decentralization and Financial Management Practices of Subnational Government, Evidence from Ghana. I make a little reference to it in my take for your consumption about how we have managed to rather, you know, fleece this country, the corruption, particularly the political corruption. And those of you who are also in public uh, offices, you know, civil servants, it's so rife, it's bad. I mean, it's not good. <laughs> then, also in the studio is Adam Mutawakilo. You have heard of him so many times. I suspect this will be your first time yeah. on News File. Yes, this okay. is my first time. Good to have you. Great. And yeah. you know why he's here? He's here because I'm sure you have heard him a lot on the energy uh, matters because he is a uh, ranking member, Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament. He's the MP for Damongo. Also in the studio is Joseph Dindyok, Dindyok Pemka. He's MP for Timpani and Deputy Attorney General and Minister for Justice. Gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the show. Good morning. Good morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, on the phone lines, we'll be speaking to Esalamte, who is a beneficiary of NAPCO. Uh, we have looked through some of the documents for NAPCO and a couple of questions come up. We'll find out what she feels about the opportunity that a hundred thousand of them get to start to get to earn 700 Ghana CDs every month. And the president says it is not money that will be given to them for free. They must work to earn it. Right. So we start with the president, and he commissioned the 100,000, you know, NAPCO beneficiaries and had some very, you know, insightful uh, words for them. Let's listen. I admonish our NAPCO trainees to be dutiful and productive in the areas you have been assigned. I urge you to demonstrate on a daily basis that you value knowledge as a basis for effective performance and productivity. You must show your pro professional credentials through timeliness and punctuality. And above all, live beyond reproach so you can discharge your responsibilities with efficiency so that all, at the end of the day, can vouch for your integrity. Your performance will be monitored through an innovative mobile application which will be deployed soon. NAPCO trainees must bear in mind the government is investing some 3 billion CDs of taxpayers' money into this program. Your monthly stipend of 700 Ghana CDs is not free money, and you must earn every peso of it through hard work and dedication. Right, so that's the president, of course. 100,000 
Ghanaians who um, had been unemployed now can look forward to 700 Ghana CDs a month at least. They can look forward to getting up every morning and going to work. That alone brings them some dignity, doesn't it? But how exactly is NAPCO a solution to the unemployment situation in the country? After three years, they get out and are supposed to uh, have gained sufficient experience and uh, connection to be able to find some job. Is that it? Okay. Let's get to the phone lines and uh, begin quickly with one of those beneficiaries, Esther Lamte. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us on Newsfile, Esther. Hello. Good morning, Samson. Great. Thank good. you for having me. Right. So it feels rather exciting that you have an opportunity to wake up in the morning and go to work, right? Hello, Samson. Hi. Can you please speak up? Okay. Um, you must be happy that, I, su I suppose, commencing, is it Monday or sometime, you wake up in the morning and you go to work, right? Yes. Okay. How does it feel? <laughs> Hello? How does it feel? Uh, it feels great to be um, employed again after being in the house for so many years, for some of us. Mm. And for those who just completed national service, it still feels great to be engaged. Okay. As a, a worker. Yes, we've heard stories about people who have been at home for, you know, upwards of three, four, five years after graduating from university or, or from some polytechnic. Um, what's, That's your, very true. What, what's your story? Um, well, I, I've been in the house for about five years. I've been in the house for about five, almost six years now. And... Uh, you know, you've been in and out of work just maybe once. For me, it's been just once that I got employment. I was just a contract job. And after that, I've been in the house for about um, two years. And so when this opportunity came, I just thought it was, it was better than being at home and not earning anything. Okay, so what's your but, educational background? Sorry? I'm, I'm a, a university graduate. Okay, what did you do at the university? I read, I read social sciences. Mm. And, and for six years, you say you, you didn't have a job? Yes. Okay. So this job, you know clearly what it is that you are going to be doing. Which of the modules are you on? I'm on Revenue Ghana. Revenue Ghana. Yes, please. So tell us about your assignment. Um, well, with Revenue Ghana, um, what the president has said and what we've heard, we are going to work with Ghana Revenue Authority, so they would have to place us where they want us to work, all towards um, the um, revenue collection for the country. So whichever area Ghana Revenue Authority deems fit that we should work in, that's where they are going to place us. Right. But the understanding was that you guys had been taking through some sort of, you know, uh, training, and yes, so please. you are clearly aware of what exactly you will be and the role you play. You don't yes. seem to sound like you are very sure what it is you're going to do. <laughs> yes, because we've not been given specific module training. There was, it was a general training that they gave us, and that, well, for me, I wouldn't really call it training because um, just a few people came to speak with us, and the one that was, was actually called training was just we um, were taken to Ashaiman for our district. There were various districts that converged there, which actually I really didn't see any need, but we're taking them. The resource person discussed um, knowledge, punctuality, and integrity, KPI. Okay. Um, yeah, and then <laughs> we wrote our names and came back home. We've not been taken through any rigorous training especially one that's specific to our modules that we've chosen. I see. Now, the, 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 the sort of training that must have been given to you, um, you, you were not through the training process, as it were, giving specific education on your module. 
and no. the specifics you are supposed to be engaged in? No. So what do you understand now that that will be done now that you have been engaged? Yes, that's what we are, we are expecting, that's what we are hoping for, that when you're placed, then the modules would give you specific module training. Mm. As of now, if we, we are put to work, I'm sure they would have to train us before we know exactly what we are going to do for Ghana Revenue Authority. Mm. Same for all the other modules. All right. So, which of the Ghana Revenue Authority offices are you going to go to start work and when? Something, see, that's a problem now. We've not been posted yet. We don't know which offices we are going to work. We are only placed under our district for now, but we've not been posted to any specific offices. Our postings have not come. We are sure that they would come. We can verify our postings at the Independence Square when we met on um, um, Wednesday, the 17th, where the personal ceremony was held. Mm -hmm. But nothing like that happened. I think it was just to get us there. But we got there and nothing like that happened. And as of now, we've not heard anything when our postings are, are coming out, when we are starting work, actually, because we've been promised, oh, you start in August, you start in September, you start in October. Now we are past the middle of October. We are here in November. Some are even speculating that we'll start um, next year. If that's the case, we are pleading. They should um, let us be aware of when exactly we are starting work so that we can prepare ourselves for that. Okay, so, but you have signed the sort of contract, right? The agreement. Yes, please, we have. You have signed it. Yes. And in that agreement, it is very clear that you are going to begin work in August. Is that not what is there? That is what is there. Right. And it says that... No, in, in October. In October, yes, and you are going yes. to begin to receive your, your pay or your stipend. So you're expecting to receive your stipend even though you've not started work? That's the thing. But we were told by our coordinator that, well, the letter is a conditional letter of engagement. It doesn't really um, hold. It doesn't, what it says there is not what it actually is. They can change it. So we need um, lawyers to actually interpret this one for us. According to the letter, it says we are going to receive our stipends by the end of October assuming that we are going to start work from 1st October. Mm. But then our coordinators came to tell us last week that the stipends will start flowing in from 15th of November, assuming that we are going to start work on 15th of October. And we still haven't started. So is it going to um, be pushed on because we've not started? And it's through no fault of ours. Mm. We've always been available and ready for work. But it looks like um, the authority has not finished whatever it's doing for us to start work. So is it going to affect us because of whatever is going on? And when are we actually starting work? When are we going to be paid? Okay. How, how are you expecting to receive information about where you are going to be posted to and uh, when you start work, since you are not sure about that anymore? Well, we're hoping that they would um, come on the media more often and make these announcements for all of us to hear. And NAPCO usually sends us messages for um, events or any upcoming anything. So if they could do that, and some, uh, some also through our coordinators, but if they leave everything to our coordinators, some of them take advantage of the fact that we don't know what's happening. And uh, because they are put in charge of us, they just call us to our various districts for nothing. And sometimes they don't really discuss any issue of importance, something they could have said on the various group pages they've, they've created for us. They will call you, you take transportation, even though it's within your district, some of the district offices are quite far from where we are. Mm. So you go there and only to hear somebody saying something that has been said since we started this training, somewhere 26 September. Okay, so the letter, the invitation you received that uh, got you to the passing out ceremony um, yes. actually said that invitation to NAPCO passing out ceremony, venue yes. Black Star Square, Accra, date the 17th of October 2018. The time is 7 a.m. The guest of honor is His Excellency the President. And they say it is for validation for institutional placement that will commence on arrival from 6 a.m. So you got there at 6 a.m.? Yes. So what were you Nothing told then happened. about the validation process? Nothing happened. 
normally. Did, did you ask? That. Did you ask? We asked. Anybody you ask says nothing happened for us. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. We didn't see anything like that going on. To you're saying that you felt that was just a ploy to get all of you to the venue. We actually knew that when we got the messages, but we had to go anyway. Mm. Especially for those of us in Accra, people were passed from other regions. When they got there, we had clothes. Well, that's, I'll leave that for the politicians. But for us, we have concerns. When mm. are they posting us? When are we starting work? How does that affect when we are going to receive our salary? Okay. You're stipend. We should let the information flow. Mm. Um, NAPCO is supposed to provide us with um, other things. They said badges, name tags, and all that. We've not yes. received any of those. According to your, the term, or call it the contract, the agreement, yes. you are supposed to wear your badges every day. Yes. You go to work and you are supposed yes, to be very punctual. I, I, I. Yes. All right. And you understand and that if you are late, uh, you don't show up for work for a number of days, you are going to lose your job as well. So now that you yes. don't know, even though you have been told you start work in October and you don't know where to go, do you have fears that some days are counting against you already that you are not aware of? Yes. Yes. Exactly. Those are our fears. Okay. Because if we were told that well, we, you are going to start work on 15th, so now the salary will move to 15th November. Now mm. we've not started, then it's going to move ahead. Mm. But I don't know, please, you are the lawyers. You should um, interpret this for us. The conditional on the letter of engagement, does it affect that part, like the salary part, or it's conditional because you are being placed on probation for about six months, after which you'll be given a permanent letter of employment um, oh, by my reading, by my year. reading, the the six months that is giving you is mm -hmm. uh, even if it's probation, it's supposed to be paid. But the six months is just a period when you are supposed to have used to confirm that you really have have been coming to work. And then after which period, if you leave NAPCO, if you leave your posting, they can do a recommendation or, as it were, a reference for you if you are seeking job uh, elsewhere because. If, when, if you look at it, they say that you are going to do quarterly um, ev uh, evaluation. So you do one in December, and you are supposed to do one in March. So okay. I, I don't think that should affect your ability to receive your stipend. Okay, okay I'll share okay. portions of it with my guests in the studio, and then they okay. will try um, and interpret just, for yeah, you. Please, one, one more issue. Some of our colleagues, hello. I'm listening. I'm supposed to be asking you questions. You attend to ask me the questions. <laughs> Let go please, ahead, please. Issue, go right? ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, um, some of our colleagues um, were not able to do their interview in the district, their preferred district, because they were fully booked. So they were asked to choose other districts, mm -hmm. some of which were far from where they lived. Okay. So um, they did the, the interview there. What I heard was that the, those, the panel was supposed to indicate on it that these are not, these people are not from this district, and so um, they would, their names would be sent to their preferred district. But it looks like they, some of them did not do that. Mm. So um, they confronted our, our coordinators about it. They were sure that oh, it will not affect you. It's just the in, um, interview you went to do in another district. So they've done all their registration with the preferred district that they chose earlier. And now their names are not in the list given to their preferred district. They now have to go to the other district to go and check. Some of them have found their names there. But for some of them, they said they are waiting for the postings. But if it should affect them, assuming you are in one district, you're in a district which is so far, how are you going to work? Because you are supposed to be placed within your district. That's why you were asked to choose a All preferred right. district, okay. which is close to where you stay. Mm. Please, they should address that one also for us. All right. Esther, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Right, so that's Esther Lamte, a beneficiary. Uh, she has, um, she's excited about this, the prospect. Uh, very happy that she has the opportunity, six years after graduating from the university, now she has the opportunity at least to, to, to do some decent work, work at all, and earn something. And, but there are concerns. They have not been posted. There was supposed to be a validation process at the Independence Square. I can't believe how they were going to do that at that venue. Uh, these processes were done online, and then all of them are 100,000. You're expecting them at the Independence Square to validate the, them at that point? I, I just don't believe how that was possible. So maybe their suspicion is right.
that that was only used to ensure that all of them they came in their numbers for the purposes of the you know the show <coughs> the optics that is also important for uh, the politician especially you know <coughs> right but those who have not uh, who went to interviews in other districts and need to be indicated that they will be in their districts of course you know that 700 may not be sufficient enough to take care of they are transportation if they have to move from one district to the other or they have to go rent you know places in other districts and live there and uh, be taken care of and be able to do their work let's get some answers from those who are in charge of this process okay so um i start with you doc i'm sure you you like everybody else will applaud that this is this is a good a good uh, initiative um for the start, 100,000, and they are looking to, you know, even do more of the numbers. Thank you very much. And let me say um, good morning to our viewers and listeners. I think um, I should be happy as a Ghanaian because when you look at the statistics, it tells us that either we do something now or we forget about the future of Ghana because the average turnout by way of graduates from our public and private universities, now that we've liberalized education, is about 300,000 a year. Now, if the economy is not expanding to absorb these people, you can understand the impact on the economy. So when I heard that uh, government has come up with this initiative, I was very happy. But then if I'm happy, then it means the government is responding to a particular constitutional or legal requirement or an obligation on the government. And I was happy about your take because you concentrated on the directive principles of state policy specifically Article 36.1. And I want us to add Article 36.2a to it, where it reads that the government would have to guarantee the guarantee of a fair and realistic remuneration for production and productivity in order to encourage continued production and higher productivity. So yes, government has introduced this initiative. It will reduce unemployment or close an interim gap we have seen it before. question I'm asking myself is, have we thought through it well for sustainability? To what extent are we including the private sector? Aside from that, we shouldn't just throw money out there. And I was happy the president indicated that the 700 a month stipend you're going to receive is not for a token. They're going to work for it. And in economics, if you pump so much in it and you don't get them to work, to produce the required goods and services to meet it, you are promoting inflation. So what kind of cost-benefit analysis went into it? And I'm very happy they are to register and work with districts. But the question I'm asking myself is, to what extent have we decentralized the operations of NAPCO? And then how have we brought on board the district assemblies so that the system would be commenced and completed in such a way that the exit strategy would be that the local government or district assemblies would own up mm. the process. And then they will own it, run with it, mainstream it into their processes. The districts are in need of human resources. So that they will not always look up to the center. That they will be able to absorb these people, pay them, put them out there to even go and mobilize re revenue. And then pay them out of the revenues they mobilize. In fact, some of them do not have quality manpower like these you know, classes Graduates. of people who are That's going right. there. That's right. So, so, so I, I think to start with, it's a very good thing. But I think we should work on the sustainability. We should decentralize the operations. We should make sure that we have the district assemblies owning the process. It should get to a point in time where government would take its hands off and hive them off to the local government and allow the local government to make good use of them to increase productivity, increase revenue, so that we can reduce unemployment. But I always caution that we should make sure that the sustainability bit works. Because if we are not able to sustain it, it's going to create a lot of problems for us. So what I would advocate that we do is that we do what we call the a benefit. Said, uh, sustainability. The president said we have dedicated 3 billion CDs of the taxpayers' money for this program. So as for the money for it, <laughs> at least for this group who have three years to serve, they are catered for. That's right, something. It's a brilliant idea to start with. That is the seed capital, the seed fund that would go into its initial commencement. Mm -hmm. But 
Looking at the resource constraints of this country, we are, not, we are not going to be able to raise that amount of money every year to support they the have, process. They have done the math that because of their inputs with <coughs> these various entities at the district levels, so much income is going to come. I'll look for the figures that were estimated. There are some estimates that were given out okay. that they are going to be able to even more than double the income that these assemblies are able to generate, or these entities are able to generate. Therefore, there'll be money. Yes, I would, I would not expect, you see, I don't expect government to continue to finance it in perpetuity. Mm. To get to a point where government will take its hands off, give them to the local government, and then they apply the principle of cost, benefit, usage, and training. Now, when you, when you do that, then you are able to use them to generate money, and they generate more than what you spend on them so that you have access to invest into the system. So what all that I'm cautioning is, let us develop a sustainability strategy in such a way that government will not have to cough the 300 million or 300 billion every year. Mm. To get to a point where government will take its hands off, government will rather prepare them and give them to society. Again, we should co do a continuous revision of the models so that the models will be of contemporary relevance to people. Well, it gets to a point where in a particular year, a particular model will be needed because individuals, institutions, the private sector needs a particular group of people to intervene in a particular sector of the economy. So once we put those ones two in place, I'm very positive that it will make a lot of impact. Otherwise, it's one of the best things. And finally, Samson, let us develop a national human resource plan that would help us do a very good future projection of the human resource requirements of this country. Once we do that, it will then inform our planning. And then even as we do that, let us manage our population issues. Mm. But we haven't prioritized the mainstream population issues at all in our development agenda. And if we don't manage it well, with the liberalization of the educational sector, what is going to happen is that you have some of these interventions coming. Mm. But I can tell you that if this year you are able to recruit 100,000, and next year the universities and other training institutions produces 600,000, 700,000, you are always going to have a constant deficit of 400,000 to deal with. So in doing all of this, let us develop a comprehensive national approach mm -hmm. of dealing with the population issues, uh, sustainability, and then making sure that we do a continuous revision of the models. I, I hear you keep a people. focus on the private sector uh, right. and to suggest that that is the only way to sustain this. It's um, one of the ways. Have, yes, you have uh, the best way, really, you suggest. Yeah. Um, the, the models feed Ghana definitely for the agriculture you know, mm -hmm. sector, as in the agri-ministry. Agri Educate Ghana, the education ministry, because you've seen letters that they have written, as in the NAPCO, you know, <coughs> secretariat, mm. uh, or through mi ministries, mm. right to ask for vacancies in these areas so that they can post NAPCO uh, beneficiaries to, to, their, to those places. Let's call them nation builders. That's what they are. Mm -hmm. uh, Revenue Ghana, which is the GRA. GRA. Heal Ghana, which is the health sector. Of course, the nurses who are waiting clearance, have issues with that because they have been trained, they are ready to do their job, they are not coming on to learn anything. Uh, are they prepared for they are ready. a month stipend? They are ready to work, but they cannot be giving the job. So that's uh, an issue for them. Then you have the uh, Enterprise Ghana. Certainly you look at the uh, public, uh, private sector here, the Digitize Ghana and Governance Ghana. The private sector they may have need for some of these people like you suggest. But like some colleagues have put on social media, even they say a good number of law firms engage young lawyers and they don't pay them 700 or it's 700 that they pay them. These private entities might need them but might not want to be saddled with paying 700. Something, they may want to pay less. Something it's, it's interesting, mm. and I would I would I would argue out that even in the private sector, you get some of them paying more than seven hundred. If government comes out that the base is seven hundred, because in the private sector they would they, they use what we call the input output analysis. Right. So you come in and they will make sure you deliver. You come in and they will make sure they will supervise you. So if the private sector person thinks that look the person's output as against the cost I'm mean, carrying on the person is more. Some private sector institutions may pay them higher. Okay. Let's look at the national service scheme. Mm. Some people go to do national service in certain private sector institutions. 
So the amount they are supposed to pay them may be 400. Yeah. That institution gives them the top up just because their output merits it. Right. So for the private sector, I'm very positive that they are one of the best ways of solving the problem. And All people right. will be happy. Koku, let's, let's hear your, your, well. your take on this matter. <coughs> And as you listen to Esther, very excited about all of this, uh, obviously she speaks about issues you can tell that it's not as if she wants to be heard to complain, but she's <coughs> concerned that there's an opportunity that has come and yet she, doesn't, she can't see her way clear. Yes, I wish we had had an input from the NACO, uh, coordinator. NACO okay. coordinator. We will we'll, we'll put him on the phone. Yeah. It would have yeah. given us some clarity. Okay, we will. Because some of the issues the lady raised, I would have expected that had been handled properly, right. effectively, mm. before the lunch. Yeah, he'll be on the show. So, yes, yeah, yeah. so uh, in the absence of that input, uh, it's a bit tricky. I have to be very honest with you. I, I do not want to make judgmental calls in the absence of sufficient information. But why, as you say, we are expecting that input, which may lead to some clarification, fair deal. But at the same time, you could see the lady's enthusiasm and, you know, commitment to an exercise that if properly and effectively undertaken, will push this country forward. And that's where the focus should be. Right. I think this is a very great initiative. This is a targeted group, the graduate uh, unemployed uh, personnel who are being targeted. We've had many initiatives in this country's history also targeted at different areas. You know, you go back to the Nkrumah days, we had the Builders Brigade or the Workers Brigade. It, it didn't target just graduates, you know. It was more for the unskilled personnel and things. Uh, at Champon days, we had a National Reconstruction course, mm -hmm. you know. And even back to recent times, if you fast forward, youth in agriculture and all those things. We've tried uh, the NYEP and all that. It was a security issue. Kofodam saw youth unemployment as a security issue. And in fact, they got a national security secretary to work out all the NYEP did, uh, now it is YEA. They yeah. do two years. That's these, right. These guys are fortunate to do three. Yes, but mm. here's a targeted, it's a focused group. That, and we've just been told that about 300,000 come out annually. That's an explosive figure. Mm -hmm. you know, so it means that even this initiative, initiative, however good it is, perhaps it's not sufficient if you look at the scale of the problem. But we must start somewhere. Mm -hmm. you know, the Chinese will tell you that a journey of 1,000 miles uh, step starts with the first uh, step. I, I wanted some little clarification. When you talk about the enterprise Ghana, which is the private sector area, I was thinking, I, I got the impression that we are being told that it's the private sector that will be paying the 700. I thought that was coming from the state to the private sector. Okay, okay. So you That's, just you just get ready, you take them on, and the state takes yes, care of the payment. Yes. Okay, and, then, and yes, then, then the private sector will love to take advantage why of not? this. And so it enhances private sector oh, development oh. itself. It brings in some investment into that area. That's right. the way I see it. Okay. Of course, if you know the philosophy of this administration or the party, in government, which these days is diluted by all sides, is that they believe in the private sector being the engine of growth. Right. If you want to do sustainable jobs, uh, create sustainable jobs, this party and its tradition, they believe in pushing the private sector. But you can't wait to do all that. You must also, as government, do some interventions that can help, you know, that, uh, uh, ameliorate the problem and I see the NAPCO in that contest. Mm. So some state support, some state intervention to help these uh, Ghanaian citizens you mm. know, who must find jobs. So to, to that extent, and I, I find that targeted. You see, they, they've done, they, they talk about Educate Ghana, right. that's in the education field, isn't right. it? Health Ghana, that is the health sector. Feed Ghana, that is the agriculture sector. Uh, Revenue Ghana, which is the ladies' uh, area, D digitized Ghana, and enterprise Ghana, civic Ghana. It's, they've selected, and I think these are very useful areas mm. to select. This is fine in ideas, let me be honest with you. The key thing is going to be implementation. Right. 
we've had one subculture in this country where we've flowed very beautiful ideas, beautiful mm. programs. When it comes to execution, we have a program. Mm. There are a few areas I would alert them. See, in terms of the cash flow, sending the monies to the places where they are to be sent and payment. It's a perennial program in this country. Mm. Now, if this program... They seem to be developing an East Ridge thing, right. system for them, and that's how they are going to be paid. I hope it works right. and works efficiently. You see, when you begin to have challenges with cash flow, there will be problems. In this day of mobile money interoperability, uh, I, I it is not think that, that those problems that used to dog the NYEP and so on shouldn't be a problem. Well, I'm, I'm All very these conservative. All beneficiaries will, will own phones. I am very conservative. I'm very cool. Mm. So that's why I see all these documents <laughs> here. <laughs> but, but I hope, I pray sincerely, and I'm, I'm also looking at the situation where the money leaving the state coffers, you see, is not the transmission of it. It's whether it's ready and it's released, disbursed. Okay, sometimes we budget for it. Mm -hmm. All right. Then it comes to disbursement, there's a challenge in terms of bureaucratic, typism, all those things. So I'm hoping, to be honest, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that I don't want a situation where within two, three, four months, we begin to hear that these people have not been paid for two or three months. It demotivates. And then those personnel out there, they themselves, they lose that impetus. Then the public credibility of the program mm. also suffers. Mm. When you put all those things uh, together, implementation gets bogged down. Okay. We've had so many experiences with such beautiful programs. And I'm being very sincere about this. I love this program. I think it's a very beautiful idea. It's very visionary. But it is the implementation. And I believe that's what Doc was talking about when he kept on so talking about sustainability, sustainability. Okay? It's not just the financial. It's also the management, the kind of people we are putting in there. What is it that we are doing so that we can continue to motivate the recruits or the trainees? It's key. These days, you go looking for employment. You are told, how many years experience have you had in the field? Mm. If it's just your paper, nobody takes you. So this skills gap that they are using the three years to enhance, to build, is critical. I agree with Doc, we should find ways and means, and we've said this many times, linking... Don't you find that they'll be doing mostly legwork wherever they find themselves? And so the question of real experience, as in, uh, may not be complete. I'm not too sure if it's just legwork per se. It, it would be surprising if it's just legwork. Do you mean they are going to be messengers? you are called by your boss and sent somewhere. No, some of the things, if you look, eh? digitized Ghana, mm. it comes with some technological, technical mm. know-how. They may be collecting data for the purposes of the no. digitization. No, collection of data to itself get, to is, get a a technical, is a technical which, uh, process. Dr. Has been leading. That itself is a technical process right. that can enhance their knowledge and competence in a certain direction. Okay. The health sector, I believe the same thing. Every sector I've looked here comes with a certain technical competence. Of course, that educate Ghana, they will teach. They so, will teach. Mm, they will so it gives you experience. a certain level ex of experience. I mean, to be honest, I'm sure Doc will explain it better than I do. But something comes. Mm. You know, you gain something rather than sitting home and rusting. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Kuku. Thank you. All right, so... Hmm. All right, this definitely is not a panacea or an alternative for the badly needed job creation, but you will agree that it's a good stopgap measure, is it not? Me? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, good morning to our cherished viewers and my colleagues, uh, and then more especially the good people of Damongo constituency. I have my senior man here. Uh, my br uh, senior brother mentioned of stopgap measure. But let, I want to go back a little. The mantra of MPP before and immediately after election. And before that, I want to quote something small from the, the president. This was on the 27th of August, 2017. 
and uh, then <coughs> we came to create private sector jobs, not public jobs. And there is an interesting paragraph there. If I go down, we came not to create jobs in the states. We came to create jobs in the private sector. That is our mantra. That is our vision. We will leave the creation of state jobs to the socialists who want everything to be done, to be dominated by the state. That is our vision for Ghana. Our vision for Ghana is about a striving economy built on the enterprise and the energy and the initiative of the Ghanaian private sector. Full stop. So that indicates clearly their motive is to create, expand the private sector to absorb. So therefore, if you go to their manifesto, you will not see NAPCO mm. in there. As, so that tells you that maybe it's after that. Maybe after August. There's there, even a freeze on public sector yeah. employment. So yeah, they thought that, mm. OK, the private sector is not absorbing the graduates, uh, unemployment, unemployed graduates as we expected. Therefore, we did a stop gap measure, and I, I support clearly with that. And when it comes this way, then there are so many issues that comes up. <coughs> One, YEA has been implemented over the years. It has a legal backing. It has some dedicated source of revenue. It has some graduate programs on it. Is it necessary we expand it or we establish that? And in the est establishment of NAPCO, there are a lot that must go in. Because if you look at national service, for example, even before the posting, they will want to know from the educational sector, how many do they need? From the health sector, from private uh, enterprises. So if you are a private enterprise, you want you write to them, which they will collate and know that this is the required. If they have access, then they now think about how to uh, push them. But what we are hearing after this indicates that that assessment was not conducted. Because it is now that uh, various uh, schools are asked to bring in the vacancies they have. So why should you launch something when you haven't actually collected that this is the required how about at the end of the day, the number is far less than uh, 100,000. But meanwhile, you have promised these young people that they will work. And if we force and impose them, uh, Dr. Nearly said, inflation sets in. Because you, are, you now have more variable inputs on the same thing. They are taking salary, output production of goods and services do not commensurate the payment that you are going to make. So it will trigger an increase in general level of prices and therefore inflation. So, so I think that this wasn't well taken through very well. The second one is the three billion. Mm. But before you deal with that, you, are you oblivious of the fact that they are on a number of projects? The one district, one factory. They say that is, that is actually the fulcrum. That's right. They are building factories in every district and, you know, <laughs> people are supposed to get jobs. This is private sector led, government support, private sector led. But this one, the NAPCO, is in the meantime, what do you do as they raise the unemployment explosion? And targeted at graduate. That is why mm -hmm. I indicated clearly, uh, my senior brother made it, it's a, an intervention. But did we do, are we, have we done it the way it should be? Or we could have added it to YEA? That is another question. But one district, one factory, yes. How far have we gone with it? That is another question. How long is it taking to start absorbing this? How many businesses are willing to go into that? Government said it will provide support, promise one district. How many far, how many so far? have come up. So you have to analyze a lot. And also look at, in the private sector, we've heard of some enterprises or companies laying off workers. 
So you don't talk about 100,000 private sector, you look at the job losses there as well. The breweries came out by the end of October, about 1,500 people will be going home. Very clear with that. So many already. So many have been laid. Because of the banking situation? Is it necessary the banking? These people say cost of production. Okay. No, I'm saying in the banking sector, the because of the bank, is banks another, that are collapsed. If you take a cost of test staff, right. about 600 uh, staff have gone home. If you just say, Trazaco recently, casual workers have been asked to go home and wait for three months. And the, the CEO said it clearly that it is as a result of the economic situations. They are not performing as expected. So you don't look at NAPCO There's as a media front as, also. As an, they are laying off in the media front. In the media front. So yeah. you don't look at the 100,000 alone. You look at what is the private sector doing. It's not picking up as we expected. So, so what's your point? So my point is... You shouldn't do this. No. I think that approaching it this way will create huge challenges in the future. It could have been added to YEA, where the structures are already in place. It has a dedication. If we want to increase it, the, the tax and whatever we have for it, mm. we could go. Okay. But now taking $3 billion dedicated, when we know our budget, always we don't meet. Right. Join you, organize uh, this budget here is just recently, where they said if you take out <laughs> the, what is left for government to be able to perform is about 98%, uh, not 8% to automatic 2% left. And you do your mathematics. How do they do the mathematics? If you don't have the uh, known vacancies that they will require, they will occupy and how much they will produce. So how did they do the mathematics to indicate that there will be increase in revenue? That is the question, basic question. Because if my district, we have about 100 of them, however, we have 50 vacancies. I don't think the increase in revenue will be able to raise enough to pay. We also, as young politicians, have followed government. I, I, know, of a, I know of a practical example where uh, Roxanne Bukhari, who is now come to the Jubilee House as a minister at the, flag, at the Jubilee House, who was at the Upper East Region as a minister there. When he was the, he was the MC at the time, what he did often was that when schools are on vacation and so on, he will use particularly the university guys. There's a grouping known as Bonaboto. He will use them and they were always ensuring that he was getting good enough revenue, so much, and then he gave them you know, some sort of you know, remuneration out of that. So it is clear that when you are getting people of this caliber, some of them, they have, they are, their quality is higher than what you already have in these places. So they would definitely bring in revenue. As, as a student, when I was in Legon, we used to. But we are not being paid every month. And we realize that after a period, even after three weeks, you have some constant revenue. And if they want to remit all of us, there will be nothing for the district assembly. So that is why I'm talking about numbers. If the number is so huge and the jobs are available, you'll be using whatever they have read and increase. Mm. You'll be using it to pay. Okay. So there is always the variable cost in respect to raising that revenue. Okay. And that is why I was saying, being in politics for a while, the government says, okay, we are moving from taxation to production. So if I increase production, there will be employment, businesses will make profits, then you can I'll tax. tax it, and I'll get money. That was the mantra. Yeah, but it doesn't happen overnight. Now, it's a process, no, isn't but, it? but now, came with oh, news and stocks. After one year, we are now going more back into taxation. So, so it doesn't necessarily translate that because they have the figures on paper, it will translate automatically to yielding the desired results. Okay. And that's why I say I doubt the analysis because if you are employing 100,000 people and you cannot pinpoint a district, and so this district, the health sector needs this number, the educational sector needs this number. And now 
That is what you are now they, collating. They are doing that. They are doing that. No. Mm. You, yes, say, you say they are now it. collating. Yes. yes. They, are, they are doing it. Yes. Um, I believe that. That should have been done before. When I was saying that, I was referring to one letter, for example, uh, which is supposed to be from the education service and it's dated the 16th of October. You think that's too late. They should have done this long ago. And yes. the 16th of October letter uh, is going to all metro, municipal, and district directors of education. And it's asking them to declare vacancies. You are kindly requested to furnish the regional directorate with vacancies in your various basic schools for posting of personnel from the National Builders Corps, NAPCO, Educate Ghana module. Vacancies must reach the regional directorate of education by Friday, the 19th of October, 2018. You're saying this a little late. You should have done yeah. it. Thank you, time. yes. The very day it was launched, I listened to the minister nominate for information. And he indicated clearly the next day they will be getting their placement. <laughs> the, my sister just mentioned that they have been told they will start on the 15th. Mm -hmm. And they are not sure it's past 15. Now, if you ensure this un unemployed graduate. If, I, if you look I at this letter, the, 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 there's a problem in that kind of promise. Yes. Because if you are writing a letter on the 16th to ask for vacancies, you cannot promise them that you place them by the 15th. That is, that is the issue. Now yes. they're now going to find out how many vacancies are there and how many people to send there. And that's what I'm saying. At the end of the day, if the vacancies are, let's say, 60,000, mm. what happened to the 40,000? Because you have, you have already recruited 100,000 mm. without knowing the vacancies available. If you check with the NACRO people, I'm told November 1st, there will be effective placements. November 1st, effective placements. Okay, so uh, as if you are listening, Kukubaku <laughs> says that. The, G, the Revenue Authority, oh. okay. the Ghana Health Service, okay. the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, mm. and the Ghana Education Service. Okay. No, Kukubaku says that this is information he has and it's supposed but to I be. But I think you should call them. Yeah, okay. we, we yeah. Uh, uh, okay, he's on. Uh, Dr. Yas, good, good morning and thank you for joining us on News File. Good morning, Samson, uh, and good morning to all the viewers and listeners. Uh, on okay. Georgia. Great, Great to have you. Uh, when you outdoor this program, we, were, we had you here in the studio. Uh, now you have been able to commission 100,000. Um, when exactly are they starting work? They want to know. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Samson. Um, so the, uh, for all that have followed the, the NAPCO process, um, so going way back to May Day and then... Uh, Applications completed by within a month by 1st of June with 146,968 applicants. We went through a rigorous process of trying to evaluate their suitability for the seven modules uh, and in the end interviewed over 137,000 applicants. Um, and that left us with about uh, qualified people of about 127,000 to proceed to the selection stage. So we commenced selection of applicants from the 23rd of August. Uh, and so for most of our applicants uh, who had been successfully verified, their national service you know, credentials were verified, their qualifications, uh, over 55,000 people immediately uh, from 23rd of August were able to be given a conditional offer on their selection. Um, and then subsequently we verified further uh, with the exception of uh, the many that were still uh, on pending for Hill Ghana, uh, and then a few on Educator, uh, and then Feed Ghana. Um, so currently, as we speak, uh, we are near the very full complement of the 100,000, uh, 99,811 uh, people have been selected uh, to be part of the Nation Builders Corps. Um, and that is selection. The process of interviewing, of selection, leads you to the logical conclusion of the scheme, which is people have to end in those modules, end up in those modules and in those institutions. Uh, and the institutional placement phase, currently what is happening now um, with the module implementing partners, and the module implementing partners are the very people who lead uh, these modules. So in the case of, for example, Revenue Ghana, you have the Ghana Revenue Authority. 
uh, for Educate Ghana, you have Ghana Education Service, Minister of Education, Heal Ghana, you have the Ghana Health Service and the Minister of Health. Uh, but while all of these, uh, from uh, the period of commencement of the scheme in May, uh, was happening, concurrently, uh, the NAPCO had conducted what we call a job clearing house across every ministry, department, and agency. At the same time, we went through every metropolitan municipal and district assembly. This is verifiable, and you can call our module partners to find out uh, what sort of data uh, came through this. So at the end of the process, sometime in August, we had profiled over 120,000 jobs across the ministries, departments, and agencies, and at the local levels, the metros, the municipalities, and then the district assemblies, including interest coming uh, from the private sector. Uh, and so uh, currently what we're doing is uh, placing uh, these uh, NAPCO applicants uh, within those institutions with the collaboration of the uh, module implementation partners. Uh, and we have given an indicative date uh, for everyone, every module partner, to start receiving uh, all the NAPCO applicants uh, or train, NAPCO trainees uh, in the institutions to start from the 1st of November. 1st of November? Yeah. Hello, uh, Dr. Ibrahim yes. Ayaz. Do you say 1st of November? 1st of November, correct, yeah. Okay. They were supposed to have gone through a validation process according to the invitations that went out to them for the correct. passing out ceremony. What happened? So basically, I, if you've been following what uh, the process has been, the whole essence of having um, NAPCO trainees from across districts and regions, because for the very first time what we had done uh, was a very decentralized process of going to the district level beyond the online uh, uh, processes. We went to district level to interview them, uh, and everyone who was interviewed was interviewed at a location of their own choosing at the time of their choosing. And then in the end, uh, those who... Uh, for example, because they lived in metros, could not uh, uh, access interviews at their, uh, at their locations, were sent elsewhere to be interviewed, and then subsequently uh, during placement. And I heard uh, one of our beneficiaries uh, talk about uh, her uh, sort of um, uncertainty about where some people might end up. There is no ambiguity. If you chose a preferred district as application, what happens is that currently what we have is the selection. So we're going to revert you back. Uh, to your district of choice uh, once we start placement. So we'll be working within an institution uh, within, within your district. Um, and and, and that, that, is, that is what the, uh, the process is all about. As far as validation, these are the processes that lead to verifying because we sent out messages, I don't know if you followed this, the people who we wanted come back with us uh, to us on the day uh, with the very letters that we sent out to them because we heard about uh, faking of the uh, letters in, the, in some of the districts because people uh, were quite desperate uh, to exploit uh, the desperation uh, of uh, some of our youngsters. Uh, but as it happened, I mean, with the sort of numbers that we had, the district coordinators didn't told to take charge uh, of every single person who showed up. Uh, and because of the time commitments of most of these people, we didn't want to detain them. Uh, at the center. So within a period of three hours, we had to get everyone uh, to leave the square to go back so that the process can continue within their district. Dr. Yas, you are telling me that you really intended sincerely that we are going to validate them at the Independence Square, expecting 100,000 people to gather there and for their district coordinators to validate them right there when they attended? Something. Most of what we have done, uh, which will surprise many, under our administrative record in this country. You're not answering my question, No sir. institution has ever... Can I, have a direct, can I have a direct answer to my question? Sorry, I'm, I'm answering your question. The scale of what has been achieved here goes beyond uh, arguments about a process, uh, at one of the stages in the process, which is the validation process of the particular individuals who are the genuine individuals we are expecting to show up uh, at the square. Uh, and, and so what has been achieved in terms of the scale, the numbers that we have been dealing with, and if you were at the Independence Square, you would have realized that uh, from the time of the commencement of the event between 6 and 8 a.m. when the dignitaries had arrived, it was almost impossible to proceed uh, to complete the validation. And most of them stayed uh, and handed over the letters to the district coordinators 
But those who were struggling to get back to their destinations, we gave them the latitude to do that, uh, and then the process could continue within their district. So nothing, you know, untoward happened here. Interesting. Um, uh, some of them want to know, are they supposed to be on probation for six months before they start uh, so receiving you, their stipend? If you read their conditional offer, His Excellency Danado Dango Akufuado, the President, stated clearly, the quantum of investment going into the nation builders call, it's not free money, it's taxpayers' money. Uh, and we have to be able to account uh, for this. Uh, and the whole questions about sustainability uh, bother on some of these issues, the funding element, the integrity of the scheme itself, uh, in terms of what it's seeking uh, to do uh, long term. Uh, if those are met, then probably uh, these uh, concerns will appear moot. So if you think about all these issues uh, that we currently raise, then uh, I, I, my, my sense is that, you know, um, uh, we, we, we're going to proceed to have a solid scheme that will benefit this but, country. But I ask, are they, doing a pro are they serving a six-month non-paid probation? They have, within the contract that has been given to them, they have to pass two quarterly evaluations. Those quarterly evaluations uh, is just the usual employment contract that you have, that you have to have met a six-month uh, probation period. But in our case, because we applying a work and learning program. Say, so I've read that. I've read that. I'm very sure that. Yes. I'm very sure you can give me a word in less than a sentence, really, uh, in, in a very short sentence. Because the question is, are they serving a six-month unpaid probation? Unpaid probation, you said? Yes. Unpaid probation, you said? Yes. How could that be? It's a, it's a question, so it, it, like it calls for an answer. They want to know. An employment situation, mm. and they're supposed to pass two quarterly evaluations. The first quarter, the evaluation to be done at the end of December. The next one at the end of uh, it, uh, at the end of March, and then they get a substantive letter of appointment saying that they have met the key performance indicators, and we have summarized that into those core values that we have shared widely. In Doc, terms Doc of I have read that. I have read that. Yeah, yeah, I have yeah. read that. The simple answer uh, we need is, will they be paid for the period of six months? Of course they will be paid during the period. Thank you, sir. What Thank you, you have in there is a work and learning program, which is why... Uh, okay, so, so that question answered. Over. That question <laughs> answered. <laughs> Can we explore this other issue quickly? Um, the, this question of sustainability, you threw out some figures out there at the Independence Square. Can you help us appreciate the, the value they are bringing to these uh, assemblies as you have done your estimates? Um, how they are going to bring more revenue and so on. Can you take us through that again? Uh, I, I think this is central to everything that the NAPCO process is all about. So the Nation Builders Corps was thought about uh, to achieve two things at the same time, to address uh, somehow the, the challenging issue of unemployment among the graduate cohort but at the same time improve on the delivery of public services. And I'll cite you a couple of things. These are real situations uh, involving real people in real life. So think about it. Uh, only a day after the launch uh, of uh, the, the, the passing out ceremony, we had a couple of districts, uh, one in the Volta region, the other in the Northern region, who sent a request for workforce. In the entire district and outside uh, side Crash West, for example, they had sent in 170 from their list of interviewees. Their allocation was 350. The hospital, the, the health service uh, within the district indicate that they require 90 people uh, for Hill Ghana. Their entire request for Hill Ghana was faulting because they don't have people who are qualified. They talk about schools within their district that do not have teachers. They talk about uh, institutions, uh, public services that are suffering within those, those districts. The whole point about the Nation Builders Corps is to use this high-end skills uh, by our graduates to also contribute to nation building in every sphere of our life, in the various villages, the towns, the communities, the constituencies and districts. Uh, and for me, this is the beauty of the scheme uh, in terms of how it's going to improve the output uh, and, and, and better the lives of every Ghanaian, uh, wherever that may be, in education, in health, in governance at the local level, uh, in the digitization processes that uh, currently we're engaged in, every aspect of the attempt by this administration to improve the lives, to improve the economy, to grow the economy, including the private sector. Over 9,000 people 
Currently, we have 12,000 people waiting to work under Enterprise Ghana. 9,000 of those are currently being processed to work uh, within private companies to grow those micro, small uh, to medium enterprises. We believe, based on the projections, that these will pay uh, multiple fold uh, beyond whatever investment uh, that we're currently making. And can I correct an impression? When His Excellency Danado Donko Akufuado stated the three billion, this is a summation uh, in terms of the projections over the three-year period. Uh, what this program uh, currently projected to run for a three-year period uh, is going to cost, not an annual cost uh, to the taxpayer in terms of three billion cities per annum. That's not the case. Okay. You, you, um, if you can, you know, once again, try and give me a straight answer, direct one. I heard you at the event enumerate specific, you know, revenue outcomes because of NAPCO. And I wanted you to attempt to repeat that to us, to assist us, because we, we, we had a bit of a discussion about that, particularly Dr. Rosai, and wanted to know how exactly the numbers look like. You said that for each district, um, because of their involvement, so much revenue will be generated. If you have those figures readily with you, can you share them with us? So basically, uh, I believe the figures you are alluding to uh, is the sort of um, funding that is going to go to every lo uh, local government or district assembly or uh, every community uh, that will receive the 350 uh, graduates. Uh, and the figures you have there, was, for example, if you have 350 uh, people placed uh, in a particular district, for example, which is the average district uh, allocation, uh, on a monthly basis, we're going to be having 245,000 Ghana cities paid uh, to the NAPCO trainees within that area. And um, we estimated this uh, over a, within a period of a year uh, to run into for the average district uh, about 2.8, 2.9 uh, million Ghana cities going to a particular district as the sort of investment that the government is making into providing those services within the... Uh, and what, what are the figures you spoke about as being those that they will generate? Sorry, something. Figures that they will generate in what terms? I think because of their involvement in a particular district, what that they will the bring. I have given that the figures that was communicated, the figure, what we communicated was, if you look at the average person that is going to be placed within a district, how much government is investing in that individual and the effect that it's going to have in the local economy was the figure. Those, those were the figures that were communicated. Okay. But if you had our module implementing partners, the Ghana Revenue Authority, they have given an indication of the value that they intend to have out of these uh, NAPCO trainees in the areas that they are going to deploy them, the border patrols, uh, the increase in revenue as a result of their involvement in the... Okay, Dr. Yeah, just, just, just a second. Yeah. This is part of your statement, paragraph 4. Go ahead. Your Excellency, I would like to conclude by highlighting the extent of your flagship initiative. And Mr. President, you will hear lots of this from the module implementation partners themselves. An average district with 350 NAPCO trainees will bring to the district 2,940,000 cities every year. One district, we can all do the maths. A simple arithmetic of the numbers for each model at a monthly allowance of 700 Ghana cities will unravel the scale of this. For instance, on Enterprise Ghana, the 12,000 uh, trainees um, would amount to an investment of over 100 million, okay, annually to private sector enterprises through the NAPCO scheme. So I didn't appreciate what you were trying to say. I, my understanding was because of their involvement, they could, for example, those for the revenue sector will help a local assembly to be able to collect their tolls and property rates and so on and so yeah, forth and bring in a lot of money, but not the money that central government is going to give to them and hoping that because they have that money in their pocket, that will, you know, as it were, improve the economy of that uh, place. That, that, that wasn't my understanding. So I'm sorry. Yeah, but it is my, it is my lack of understanding. Now, something. Right. Is, is, I mean, so for Enterprise Ghana deliberately injecting 
100 million every year mm. to grow private businesses, the okay. small medium enterprises okay. that we have in this country. Mm. And then also setting a seed fund at the end of the three years for 500 business leaders who are going to be mentoring 500 people from the Nakusin. So okay. what we have said there is basically not contradiction. There is value in every penny or peso that we're going to be spending uh, on, 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 on the NAPCO trainees. Yeah. And that is basically uh, the sort of figures that we're communicating. It, it is clearer now after I had read, I have read it. But can you, okay. can you end on this note for me? Um, private sector. So e enterprise Ghana model. Those people will go to the private sector. But, Correct. but the state will pay them? So um, we have given a lot of attention to uh, the design of the, uh, of the enterprise uh, Ghana model. This is being led by the Ministry of Trade and Industry as the lead uh, module implementing part. But this is how it works. So uh, the attempt is to bring together about 500 uh, enterprises, small, medium, you know, anchor industries, as, including the one district, one factory, uh, those, those coming up. Um, and the intent is to make sure that uh, in the very first year, for those that are assessed with, at, against a certain criteria, and I'll tell you uh, three, three of those items on the criteria. So in the uh, first instance, we want to, uh, to be able to determine whether you have the capacity to be able to absorb 50% of these uh, graduates who are going to end up with you at the end of the three years. That is one. Two, we have a commitment and a sharing arrangement in the second year of the implementation under the MOU that we're going to be signing. Um, and that means that you have to have the capacity to be able to pay 50% uh, or share 50% of the cost uh, in the second year. Our commitment to free you up in the very first year of uh, taking on uh, NAPCO trainees is to pay 100% of the stipends, which is at 700 Ghana. And then as a private enterprise, you are responsible for training and tooling them uh, to utilize them. And by freeing uh, those businesses up in the very first year, uh, we hope that in the second year they will demonstrate the commitment in the 50-50 share agreement. Uh, and then by the third year, they are fully responsible. But they need to communicate with us in the very first six months uh, under the enterprise module. The 50% minimum they are supposed to be uh, retaining uh, within their businesses. And okay. then they can retain uh, the other half of those uh, they are not able uh, to retain. And we hope they will be taking 100% of them if they have invested so well in them. Uh, right. for uh, the, the three-year period. And then we can plan the exit of the rest of them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you, you indeed. Um, right. So um, uh, if I can get Penka to, to oh, just, just give us a minute or two and end it uh, yes, on this subject. Uh, okay. Quickly. One minute. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 In terms of the projection of two million, it's not been very definite today how the two million will be realized. But we know the cost per year, per month, per the 350 times 700 times 12. Now he indicated the 3 billion is a projection for the three years. Now the question comes, is this is it once one time employment? Because if you take the 700 Ghana CD they receive, you multiply by the 100,000 statistics, which is three years, is 2.5 billion. We are not talking of administrative costs. So I know if you date, the, the balance will be administrative. So if it is three years, so that, that means next year there will be not be any more. And in fact, those who we engage on Enterprise Ghana, you will not have to pay them for three years, as you have just heard. Yeah. They will take, government will take responsibility for the first year, second year 50%, mm. and third year you take yes, a full responsibility. all the same. Yeah. But I'm okay. just giving. All right, thank so you. So the, the, right. is it going to follow up? Next okay. year. Thank you. Uh, so, Doc, you can also do brief before uh, yes, uh, Franka I, speaks. I, I, mm. The brief I want to bring is that it, it then suggests that government is giving a seed capital support to the local government. So if government is spending about 250000 every month, then it is up to the chief executives in their respective district assemblies to take advantage of this and then make good use of them so that on a monthly basis, they will generate a revenue of more than 245000 Okay. And I, I must say, that I was in the forum when Dr. Anyans came and did a presentation for the chief executive. And he has taxed them to be able to take advantage of this. Right. Question then is, are chief executives prepared to take up the challenge <coughs> to get the NAPCO workers to raise revenue in excess of 45000 every month? 
That's the question we need to ask. It would be such an indictment if they fail to take a good advantage, advantage of, of this situation. Yes. Um, look, I mean, mm -hmm. casual, you look at it and you say, digitize Ghana. In the next three years, with digitize the dig digitize Ghana group, if we are not finished with our uh, house numbering system and all of these things and digitize them properly, then this, this pro project has failed. Yeah. Yes, uh, Pempe. Th thank you very much. I, first of all, let me say good morning to you, Samson, and there. A very good uh, uncle Kweku, very long time yeah. dog, and then my good friend in parliament. First, let me take it up from where you, 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 you started with your take again, because my brother sought to do that as well. You know, but there's something that maybe we didn't go into, maybe as a result of either the fact that it was not necessary or something, but I think that it is necessary. You recall that. Um, the superior courts of Ghana have had to make pronouncements on this uh, justiciability thing mm -hmm. in right. respect of the directive principles, directive principles of whether state you policy. can sue the exactly states. whether you can sue the state in respect of this to make a claim or ask for a relief by way of an order of court in respect of this. And you know, two major cases stand out here: SIBA and National, National Lotteries. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you know, there's a, a slight difference, you know, in what happened in SIBA and what happened in the National Lotteries case. But all that is meant to build our constitutional jurisprudence and, and let us know whether or not at any point in time we can walk to court and ask of the court to make a declaration in respect of certain reliefs that we are actually making. Now, be that as it may, if you look at what so is happening to practicalize now, it. Yeah, if absolutely. the constitution says you should manage the economy in such a healthy way that people will be happy, uh, can I go to court and say the economy has not been managed that way, I'm not happy, I'm poor, so the government should be held responsible. That's a question. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that's why I told you there's a distinction <laughs> right. between SIBA right. uh, and mm. National Lotteries right. and all that. Mm. And for me, I prefer what happened in National Lotteries to what happened in SIBA. Okay. In any case, the most important thing is that all these efforts that are being made by government are dovetailed into practicalizing what is in the directive principles of state policy. And it is very clear and obvious that it, 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 along the line, it almost became a national security issue, mm. the unemployment issue. Because it, it looks like from 2008, 2007, 2008, when we brought along the issue of um, youth employment at the time, uh, the graduate aspect was not emphasized. If you look at it carefully, at that time it was the people who had left the senior high school. The emphasis was on that. And so the majority of those who were recruited into teaching, into nursing, into committee policing, in fact, close to 100% of them were leavers of senior high school and not graduates. That's, that's, that's a fact. Mm. Yeah. Now, so government in its wisdom looked at the uh, to totality of um, the evidence available and came to the conclusion that, look, the graduate unemployment has become a threat to national security. And the earlier something was done about it, the better. And so having come into power, this had to be taken into consideration. But I, I, I heard my brother reading verbatim and quoting His Excellency the President in respect of creation of jobs. That, I, 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 with, with the greatest respect, you, you shouldn't understand that to mean that government was going to shake its responsibility as far as public sector employment is concerned. That cannot be. Because there are certain public sector jobs that private sector people cannot be employed to, to manage it. I mean, you cannot ask the private sector to manage the teaching of our kids in public schools. So when he was making that statement, he was talking about the general creation of jobs. But those that are responsible, uh, specific reference to government agencies and departments, and et cetera, where vacancies exist, definitely government will employ to fill those vacancies. And you recall that, unlike what happened in, in, in the past, this year alone, uh, in about April, May, the GES alone recruited and posted over 18,000 teaching and non-teaching staff to various secondary schools. This is a statement of fact, you know. And many other agencies have actually engaged in recruitment. But in addition to that, this has been brought up to make sure that the thousands of graduates, as indicated earlier by my brother, Dr. Sai and others, that these thousands of graduates are giving something. And that's why there's something my brother failed to do. A straight answer to the question, which were directly answered by Kweku and, and my brother, Doctor, that is it a good policy? He never answered that. No. Because he, 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 all along, what I realized was that 
My brother was looking at the problems and weaknesses of the, 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 the system. But first of all, that the is fundamental good. That is good to strengthen it. I agree. Yeah. But the fundamental question is to answer first is whether it's a good initiative. Then you can go to talk about the weaknesses and what to do to be able to solve them and all that. But people are running away from answering that straight question. And I have, of course, when, when uh, your, your producer sent me certain things and I did my research, I realized that there are well-meaning people of, of, of my brother's party who have said that it's not necessary to have NAPCO. Yes, I, I've seen that. And I want the such people to look at the NAPCO beneficiaries in the face and tell them that, look, when we are ever given an opportunity to rule Ghana, NAPCO will be a thing of the past. We will let all of you go home. I want somebody to look at them in the faces and tell them that, <laughs> if we want to be honest with ourselves. You see, we are building a nation, and whatever criticisms you have of a policy of government must be geared towards improving it for the general well-being of the people and welfare of our people. But it should not be one that is so parochial and forget about the welfare of the people. And Sometimes we run into insensitive comments and all that. Look, you saw some of the people who were dancing uh, at the Independence Square. I have read on social media portals and all that, people say that people were bars from uh, tertiary schools and brought there to come and uh, give uh, uh, glamour to the event and all that. Really, 100,000 persons paid 700. And some said, I know graduates, and do your own research, and I know you will know some who teach in private schools and take 300 cities a month. 300 Ghana cities at the end of a month, a graduate. That's below the minimum wage. Below the minimum wage. I know people like that. Really? Yes. <laughs> 300. Do your own research. I don't believe that. That is a fact. Graduates. Mm. And then government fact, brings you, up You see the reference made to lawyers and that. Um, I, I have difficulty even believing that because I think that must have been a situation some time ago. Because today... In most of the law firms that I know and I work with, including mine, even the, the secretary <laughs> will earn more than 700. Okay. So if you say a lawyer earns or a teacher earns that less, may not Samson, be. you may have to do a general check. Mm. You will find that some may even earn less than the 300. Okay. I can tell you for a fact. But you recall that those days when we came out of the law school, of course, certain law firms were giving even 300 Ghana cities, 400 Ghana cities, some and, do and not all that. Even pay. And some do not even give anything at all. Based. Just hold the bag and go to court. And then but the you have the opportunity to, uh, to learn, within, to within a short things. time yes, to, to get to also be to share, <coughs> to share in a brief. Yeah. Sure. So, again, what is very important as far as this matter is concerned is for us to, to look at the problems as you have indicated, okay. how to address them and move on. Mm. But let me add this. The issue of 1D1F is a very important intervention that we've all not looked at critically. You see, if you, if you read the portals, some of the banks even came out to talk about how much they are committing to assist the private sector as far as 1D1F is concerned. Mm. And that is not in dispute at all. And again, I heard Uncle Kweku say it loud and clear that, look, these things are not done overnight. You have to plan and then implement them in such a way that it doesn't come to want you immediately after implementation. Okay, we, the we, thing we, dies. I, I think that Dr. Yans has done enough and we can move on to the next issue. But, that's, but, that's but I want to ask you, I want to ask you, I want to ask you, um, being, the, being a lawyer, these are some of the fears of the, the beneficiaries. In the sort of agreement or contract that they have signed with NAPCO, on stipend, it says, the NAPCO will pay you stipends of 700 Ghana CDs a month, payable in accordance with NAPCO's standard payroll schedule, beginning end of October 2018. Beginning end of October 2018. And you will receive your first payment through your EaseWish card. This stipend is not subject to adjustment during your engagement period of three years, unless otherwise directed by the government of Ghana through NAPCO's National Secretariat. You're going to pay them in October. They're going to start work. They are going to, they are going to start work in November. Yes, good. Is that how it is? Well, yes. that's my understanding. That's you said beginning, end, beginning of October. end of October. So, so November should be the no, first November lot. November should be the first lot. OK. Mm. All right. <laughs> Unless okay. you, you understood it in, in another okay. way. But, but Samson, again, there, there's just this uh, point I, I want to, to, to emphasize. You see, the issue of P 
people sometimes trying to exploit the system. It's another thing that we have to look at. And I think Uncle Kweku looked at that. It is very important because if you look at YEA at the beginning, it became a conduit for yeah. looting the state and all that. Okay. And that is why the issue of ease which coming in, I think, will solve the problem to a very large extent. If you look at some cases, and there's one of it that in which you are, and I don't want to, to so much emphasize that, but I recall that in one of those cases, what happened was that you have beneficiaries whose names come along with ghost names. Now, the beneficiaries take their pay, and then the money due the ghost names are transferred into a particular account managed by one signatory. Mm -hmm. Then it ends up getting all that withdrawn, and then gets signatures for all the others whose names came, even though they are not in existence. But in, in, in the East Witch system, that cannot be. Mm. You, you know, talk so about the be national to, service yeah. camp. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that's, that's very important okay. to put in context. Because otherwise, right. we're mm -hmm. going to, I mean, at the end of it, we are going to have, you know, remember that we're going to also have attrition. Mm -hmm. We have to look at that aspect too. Okay. There are some people who in the course will get permanent jobs and will, 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 will run away without even notice to NAFCO mm -hmm. that they, look, I'm, I have gotten an opportunity at point A or point B. We have to be able to manage those people in such a way that they haven't worked, they wouldn't work, end. All right. So that they don't go and work at another place, and at the end of the month, they come to take allowance for doing nothing. Well, well, All that well according to, to what they have signed to, yes. if you do not report to work for five days, you are in trouble. Uh, of uh, course. And in fact, the assessment they are going to do, they are going to do two of them in December and also in March. And if you do not prove yourself to be worthy, you will not continue to end. I think... Uh, we can close this chapter here. Um, job creation is an important subject matter, and so there was need to dedicate sufficient time to discuss this matter. We will read the comments, uh, some of them that you have sent. We'll take a break. When we return, we'll ask where um, 6 million uh, of the $175 million that was uh, procured as loan for hospitals ended up for a research, including a research, to tell whether the NDC will win power or not in 2016. Musa Bato in Kumasi says that it's undeniable fact that another political campaign promise has emerged. NAPCO has no legal backing, hence the future of the youth is not sustainable. That's President Akufuado want us to clap for him for creating jobs for hundreds um, which lasts for only three years and back to square one. Okay. Ilyasu in Tamale says that through NAPCO, a lot of these young people posted to the various departments would be uh, re-engaged. What's even so refreshing is that beneficiaries are free to move on when they get opportunities elsewhere. Even refreshing is that it brings some respite to parents. Um, Achu uh, in Ho West says it's a joyful news to have a young graduate engage in doing something than to be loitering about on the streets. The money to be spent on this project is worth much more than the money invested in the Guinea Fowl project. Martin Luther in Laboni says the responsibility of every serious government is to advance the welfare of its citizenry through job creation and other social amenities. Notwithstanding the initial placement challenges of NAPCO, it's far better than Mahama and his cohorts who use various schemes to create loot and share. Well, there are some people who also think that this scheme might have some of that problem. So <laughs> anyway, we take a break. We'll be right back.